we'll be talking about things like the ways that managers too frequently in our workplaces look the other way when, for example, a guy starts shooting rubber bands at his coworker two cubes from him and maybe does things that are quite a bit worse than that. Maybe starts throwing things, maybe even throws things like soda cans at that other guy. And the manager who is not in a cube but is in an office has the luxury of a door, will just close his door. We'll talk about the real effects of downsizing and work overload on our health and our well-being and our families. And we'll talk about things like the fact that we say that we cherish democracy, but most of us spend all of our waking hours in work situations that are anything but democratic. More on the home front, we're going to talk about power as the reason that we sometimes say and do the things that we do, perhaps always say and do the things that we do. We focus a lot on communication, but it's really more about the power we have and whether or not we have to listen to each other, whether or not we have to be respectful and responsible toward each other. And we're going to be talking a lot about parenting as well. So we'll be talking about things like how to help our kids develop the critical thinking skills that are so needed currently. Now let me tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm an author. I recently retired as a corporate executive. I can't say, I can't say that I recently retired without bursting into a huge smile. I worked at Prudential for 19 years, wonderful place to work. The last nine, I was vice president of health and wellness with responsibility for the behavioral health programs and services that the company offered. So I was responsible for the counseling, the confidential counseling that was offered through the on-site clinics and the management consultation that went along with that. I was responsible for the external EAP services. I worked to put together with lots of collaborators events that help to build as healthy and inclusive an environment as possible. And I love the work of coaching leaders on how to do their jobs in ways that would not only create great business results, but would actually Let's, let me put that, let me put that a different way. It would help them to create healthy, humane, positive working environments. One of the results of which is great business results. The two go hand in hand. As I was getting ready to retire, I founded my current company. It's called Greengate Leadership. And I, through this company, do all the things that I love most. So I give keynotes on leadership and diversity and inclusion and family and parenting matters and also customized trainings for organizations that are looking to spend a bit more time, perhaps a day or a little bit longer, working on their interactions. And I also do a good bit of one-on-one -on -one coaching with leaders and with others who are working on developing not only their leadership skills, but their, their parenting skills, their life skills. As I said, I'm the author of four books. The most recent is called Simple Habits of Exceptional But Not Perfect Parents. And I've also written a number of chapters in family therapy texts and articles in the family therapy literature. i just tell you a little bit about my most recent book, Simple Habits of Exceptional But Not Perfect Parents, it has two main themes. The first is that the habits that we demonstrate with our kids every day, the ways that we show them our love are going to help them to develop confidence, to develop a sense that they can take on the world with a spirit of adventure, will help them to develop a sense of joy about their lives. And that that is important when our kids are little and when they're in our homes as they're growing up, but it's, it never ends. That not only is the hands-on part of parenting important when our kids are little, but we are our kids' role models 
primary role models for our entire lives. We cut a path in life that hopefully will show them that life is a great adventure and that they can find they can find all that they want in life as well. Or perhaps we we become the the model that they don't want to follow. We don't want that to happen. I worked for a decade in a in a variety of inpatient and outpatient mental health settings and also in addiction rehab programs and also in private practice of, of family therapy. And I did that actually for more than a decade. So visit my website for information on my books. You can see videos of my television appearances. I am an on-air expert on my local NBC affiliate here in Central Mass, and I'm there once a month. You can see testimonials about how amazing I am at the work I do (laughs) and how I may be able to help you with whatever I might be able to be of service to you regarding in your own life and your own work. This program is sponsored by FEI Behavioral Health, the workforce resilience experts. You can learn more about FEI at feinet.com. That is feinet.com. FEI provides employee assistance program services. They were the network that provided services for all of Prudential's employees who either were not close to our major employee sites where there were on staff Prudential providers, or perhaps the employees didn't want to engage with one of our our employees. They wanted to engage with one of FEI's professionals offsite. FEI is a wonderful business. They provide not only confidential counseling, but also management consultation. And also they have a special expertise in crisis response. And one of the things that kept us with FEI all of the time that I was there, and I managed the relationship for all of my 19 years, was the fact that this is a company who really cares. They really care about providing the highest quality of service to people who are at an enormously vulnerable time in their lives. So I know Ted Uxin, who is the F- is FEI's CEO. I know Dan Potterton, who is the chief operating officer and other members of their executive team. This company is not your typical EAP. They are not providing just the front end of a medical programs, behavioral health plan. They care. They know how to work with you if you're their contact in the company, and they do the very best to actually help people. Now, I have to tell you, I would be saying all of this even if they were not sponsoring (laughs) Work Life Confidential. And the proof is that I have said it for years. I've done talks and presentations and I, I mention them when it makes sense to do so because they are a great, they're a great provider of help to people who are at their most vulnerable point often. So today's your opportunity is the opportunity for you and I to get acquainted. In future shows, we're going to have expert guests and there'll be an opportunity for listeners to dial in and have a dialogue. I believe that we learn our We learn the most when we have a discussion and when we can exchange ideas. And so I'm looking forward to our upcoming shows. And I have to tell you, we have some amazing guests who are lined up. So our first guest next week will be Dr. Park Dietz. Now you may have heard his name. Park Dietz is a renowned expert on the dynamics of violence. And his firm, which is called the Threat Assessment Group, is the go-to firm for businesses who are looking to make sure that they have in place the -the state-of-the-art response to disruptive behavior up to and including the potential for workplace violence. Dr. Dietz is a frequently called upon expert witness 
And so he and his team have studied those cases that make the headlines. So he and his team did a documentary on the Columbine, the two teenagers who committed the Columbine massacre. They have, he has been an expert witness with cases such as Jeffrey Dahmer and the Unabomber. So you definitely wanna be with us when we are talking with Dr. Dietz. He is the world's foremost expert in this area. We will shortly thereafter be talking with Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer. Dr. Pfeffer wrote a book called Dying for a Paycheck. He wrote that book, he wrote lots of other books as well. And if you haven't seen it, it's it's out very recently. I recommend that you get a hold of it. It is a no holds barred look at the research and look at many stories of people who have experienced the kinds of pressures that are all too common in our workplaces today. And also the pressures that come with downsizings, with layoffs. and his book is a a sobering account of where we've come when it comes to the healthfulness of our workplaces. Also, we're going to be joined by Professor Richard Wolf. Professor Wolf has written many books as had as has Pro- Professor Pfeffer. And his one of his standout books in my mind, is called Democracy at Work. And he looks at primarily economic systems and the ways that the workplaces that they create affect our lives and affect the the degree of, of control and authority we have over our lives in the workplace. So he'll be with us within the next few weeks as well we have others who will be joining us to talk about things like when your boss is a boss from hell and other subjects lots of lots of subjects that are the undercurrent they're the undercurrents they're the things that we kind of just live with i also want to remind you of my website so my website is www.greengateleadership.com, www.greengateleadership.com. We're going to pause for a break and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. I ask that you put yourself back in time to the year 2000 and it is December, it's holiday time. And if you recall, the election in November was not resolved. The results were not resolved. And so Bush versus Gore was now a case in the Supreme Court. And so I was at that time on this day, I was at a holiday party. And have you ever been at one of those parties where you know the host and you go to their party every year, but you really don't know the other people there very well. You may have a very pleasant acquaintanceship with a number of them, but there are people who you see at this party once a year. And so I was having a conversation with one such gentleman, let's say his name is Larry, And Larry says to me, he said, you know, I'm not homophobic, but I'd really like to get your take. I'd like to get the gay take on Bush versus Gore. So (laughs) there's a lot going on in that kind of a question, right? And so it took me a couple moments and I put my thoughts together and I came back and I said, Larry, first off, how can you possibly say that you're not homophobic? I'm homophobic and I'm gay. And and I'll tell you some of what I said to him and I'll go a little farther than the conversation that I had with him. But when I said that, what I meant was 
I grew up here in the United States. And so I was born in 1960. And all through school, my books, my textbooks, the people who were visible as having done everything that was valuable, everything that was meaningful, were white men. They were the people who did all that was achieved in science, in history, in the world of politics, in art, and never, never was there a mention of anything but a wife. It was never a mention of a male partner, God forbid, a husband. And so that there was no, there was no modeling. And, and of course it went way beyond that. It went way beyond that. So if you're a boy, you have probably heard on the playing field, one of the guys or one of the coaches shout at one of the boys, you run like a girl or you play like a girl or you whatever like a girl. And that message and many, many messages like them. I was once in the gym and one guy my age, at that time, I was probably in my 30s or 40s, said to another guy, hey, those look like the kind of the kind of running shoes that the girls wear. No two things. He's he's making a joke about him wearing running shoes that appear to be of a feminine style. And he's also calling he's also calling grown women girls. But we get so many messages that tell us you can't be anything like a girl. You can't be anything like a girl. And so going a little farther, there was no mention as I was growing up in the textbooks or really in movie, anything around me that suggested that people of color did much of anything of value either. And they were, if depicted at all, for the most part, they were depicted as primitives of one sort or another. So I don't have any problem saying that I grew up to be racist and sexist and homophobic. And it goes beyond that. It goes into judging people on looks and their body type. That's that's the world that I was socialized into, all of these messages. I have been working as an adult, as I was advised of this, it was brought to my attention by women, women of color primarily in my postgraduate family therapy training program. I then began to work on getting these kinds of attitudes out of myself, but that's a lifelong project. And I'll tell you one other story that sticks with me. And you see how the emotional charge of some events in our lives shape the ways that we make sense of our identity and we make sense of the identities of other people. I grew up in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. And at some point in the early 70s, I think it was around, I think it was around 1973, there was a scandal in the East Greenwich Police Department. The police chief was accused by a couple of the officers of doing something wrong, something big wrong. Again, I don't remember all the details, but I do remember that I was present with my two older brothers and my parents at a hearing. So there's a court hearing and the police chief's advocate is grilling one of his accusers who is a police officer on the East Greenwich Police Force. And his first name, the first name of this particular police officer was Lance. I remember that much. And he was corporal. He was a corporal in the police department. So the, the lawyer who's questioning him says, isn't it true, corporate, Corporal Lance Smith, let's say, that you are a homosexual? There was a gasp in the room as though everybody was horrified and you could feel it. And it was as though that question was invalidating anything and everything that this man might say. And so I, like many 
men of my era. Some had more courage than me, and this didn't happen to them. But I tied that all up, that fact that I'm a gay man up in a little bundle, and I held it deep inside. And only when I'd been married for a number of years and had a son, my ex-wife and I had a son, did it come to a point where I said to myself, this isn't going away, and if I'm gonna be a parent, I have to be an authentic human being, and so I have to address this. And I'll, I'll say a couple of other things about this. First off is that my ex-wife, now a dear friend, is one of the most gracious people who I've ever met, and still is, is somebody who I am eternally grateful for. I'm glad that we are family, and she is an amazing parent, to our now almost 26 year old son, Eric, but she's also an amazing human being and she was incredibly gracious about my journey and about our divorce process. But I will work for, for the rest of my life to expunge, get this stuff out of me and, and that's a journey. And so I'll say more about that, but I wanna get back to the story that I mentioned. So I turned to Larry and after telling him all of this, he looked a little bit relaxed. I think he was taking it in and thinking about it. And I said, so why don't you tell me what the heterosexual perspective is on Bush versus Gore? And when you, when you turn these kinds of questions around, the absurdity often becomes more evident. So for example, there's all this question, where did, does being gay run in families? And I'll say, well, I don't know, does heter being heterosexual run in families? And we just don't know these things. We don't know these things. Whether or not it's a choice, who cares if it's a choice? It doesn't feel like a choice for most anybody. You can ask most people what their sexual orientation feels like, and I think the last thing they would say is a choice. But some of these, when you reverse the question, people often, get a little clear for themselves. But again, I, I have no trouble saying I'm racist, sexist, homophobic, all of that. I'm working to end it. I have been in the workplace where I am facilitating a meeting and I recognize that I have cut off somebody and I wasn't listening as responsibly to them. And on a couple of occasions, I've not only asked them to continue and apologized but I've said that was my racism and or sexism rearing its ugly head. And if I can say that to myself, if I can watch my filter and say that has helped me to be more vigilant. I know that when I'm walking down the street and this, is, this has happened to me in Newark, it's happened to me in Manhattan. I used to work in Newark, New Jersey. And there would be, it would be about the time that school lets out and there might be some high schoolers walking by who are African-American walking toward me. And I'd see them playing with each other the way young men so often do. They're jumping and they're maybe swatting each other and talking a bit loud. And I would have that little tinge of fear and concern. And I would say to myself, look, if these were white kids, would you have that feeling? If these were kids who looked like your son and his friends who do exactly the same sort of thing, would you, would you feel this way? And of course the answer is no. I have to tell you, when I see on one of these news shows, and I use the word news lightly because I think that so many of our shows that we get information from, they give us a tiny bit of information and then they give us way, way, way too much back and forth opinion. I think that's very confusing and I think that it helps to make it cloudy, make it difficult for people to use their own judgment. That's another, that's another story and we'll go into that another time. But I have to say that there are times when I feel like I'm watching the news, the talking head, and he's trying to corner his guest. He's trying to corner his guest into saying that so-and-so maybe is or isn't a racist. And I, I always feel like, well, why can't, why can't we just say, yeah, <laughs> I'm a racist, he's a racist, we're not burning crosses on people's lawns most likely we're not we're if if we can say i'm sexist we are probably not committing the most extreme forms although we may we've learned through the me too movement 
many of us are transgressing in many, in very significant ways. But if we can say that, if I can say that, that's the starting place for trying to work to get it out of me, to change. Now, I mentioned that our shows are going to touch on power, and I want to give a little bit of an orientation to what I'm talking about. So when I look at the world, I see power exercised almost everywhere as power over, so that power means the right to dominate, the right to direct. It's a command and control vision of power. I'll tell you what to do and when to do it. And this vision of power shapes our world. Organizations are shaped in hierarchies. And this is something that I think it's really important for us to raise out of the realm of just the way it is into the realm of let's look at this because it creates all sorts of pain. I believe it creates all sorts of pain. And so, for example, in a power over world, when differences are acknowledged, the people acknowledging the difference ask questions like, which is right and which is wrong? Which is healthy and which is unhealthy? Which is holy and which is unholy? And that is a, that is a, a, that puts us in a place where we're creating distance between us. And we don't want to do that. I am hoping that we don't want to do that. And also critically in a power over world, there is the sense that if one person or one group is gaining power, then some other group must be losing it. And so if women are gaining power, gaining voice, gaining leadership roles, then men must be losing them. If people of color are getting rights, then men, then white people must be losing them. And you see the absurdity of this perhaps very, very, very clearly when you look at all the hoopla that happened when gay people, when we were struggling for the right to marry, the, we were struggling for the, the rights of legal protections that marriage offers, which heterosexual people have enjoyed for a very long time. And there were court cases brought saying that somehow there's harm created and there was no ability on the part of the complainants to to give evidence of what was being lost, what they were losing. So the alternative to power over is power with. In a power with vision, power is not I own you, I've got dominion, I've got the right to control you. Power is I have the awesome responsibility to facilitate our shared success, our shared achievement, health, spiritual growth. It's an alternate vision that brings us together, connects us more richly. And in a power with frame, difference means not who's right, who's wrong, how do we rank our difference? It means instead, hmm, that's something what you're saying or what background you've had. What can I learn from what you are bringing to me? How can I grow from my connection to you and build a bridge that makes us both have a richer experience in our lives? Not who's right or who's wrong, who's on top or who's on bottom, but, but how, can we, how can we expand our knowledge and our experience by sharing what we have as equals. And in a power with world, perhaps most crucially, when one group gains power, we all gain power. There is not a fixed economy of power. There is a growing abundance of power 
through our connection and through our collaboration. Now, what I've seen in work organizations, we they are structured as hierarchies, almost always, some, some not, but almost always. And yet there's an effort to move toward a power with way of operating. I applaud that effort. I support that effort. Part of my work and part of my mission as a speaker and a consultant is to is to support and 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 help to expand that kind of experience. It can only benefit all of us. I do training on leadership development and also on on helping leaders and everybody in organizations understand power and difference in the way that I've been talking about it. And I call that training going against the grain, meeting the challenges of inclusion. And I do believe because of what I've just been describing that there are challenges. It is not about just saying, well, can we all get along? It's not about just saying I look at people and I don't see color because we have to see our differences in order to begin to un unravel our bias. And I wanna just make, tell you one other quick story. Organizational level is a huge determinant of power and often power over of hierarchy. And in my family, one did not, I should say me or my brothers, did not disagree with my dad unless we were very, very well prepared because my dad, like most people, he meant well, he, he did the very best he could. I love him with all my heart. He has now moved on to his next journey. He's no longer with us. He's no longer alive, but he would experience most differences of opinion as disrespect. And that's the way it works in a power, in a power over world. When I worked at one of the first inpatient psychiatric programs that I ever had the privilege of working at. The chief psychiatrist, everybody's boss was named, his name was Larry. And I was a mental health associate, which, which meant that I was armed with a BA in biopsychology and I was charged with having counseling sessions with people who were at one of the most vulnerable times of their life. If you can imagine, a person is in the hospital because of their depression or their anxiety, or in this case, their substance abuse problem had brought them to a place where they needed that kind of structure. We would then talk with these people once a day, and we would report to the psychologists, the clinical social workers. Well, we were at a meeting, a big, treatment team meeting. And Larry is the facilitator of the meeting. And one of my colleagues, Rich, who had been there for longer than I had, was there as well. And Larry was talking about a case and Rich disagreed. And Rich gave his opinion and Larry sat back and he valued that opinion. He listened with open ears and with an open heart. And these guys had a conversation and that was a revelation to me that conflict difference could be negotiated in this sort of a way. And you know that the patient on the receiving end of this treatment plan, you know that that person benefited from the broadening of ideas that came through that exchange of perspectives and that exchange of, of recommendations. That's where we go. We go in a positive direction when we're in, when we're working with power, power with, with power with, there's a little bit of a, a tongue twister. And this applies in all relationships, not only at work, but certainly in our intimate relationships. And so we're gonna take another pause and, and then we'll come back and continue our conversation. Thanks for staying with me. What if we lived in a world in which no challenge that faced human beings was unmentionable? What if we could feel comfortable at mentioning at work and everywhere else, not only that we live with migraines or back problems or high blood pressure,
but that we could say that I've got depression. I've got a chronic depression problem. I live with an anxiety problem or I'm in recovery from an addiction. What if that were as okay to say? And what if we refuse to go along with the stigma associated with mental health conditions? If we recognized that stigma living within ourselves the same way that we can recognize the sexism, the racism, the homophobia, and we refused, we refused to play along. What if that were the way that our world operated? What benefits would we, re would we reap as a result of that? This is a question that I think is at the very center of many challenges in workplaces and in our lives. And so I want to tell you a couple stories. Not too long ago, I consulted on a workplace suicide. And I tell you the story not because I want to depress you, but because it's instructive. And what happened is there was a man who committed suicide on site, and it happened during the afternoon. And it was a, a very gruesome spectacle. And what's key in this story, what's key and important for us to think about is that in the immediate aftermath, there were three people who said that they knew, they knew that this was going to happen. They didn't suspect, they weren't worried about the possibility, they knew that it was going to happen. And the reasons that they gave were that this man had told them about his impulses, he had said things like, I am on a business trip. I'm on the eighth floor of the hotel where I'm staying. And I hope I don't, I don't do it while I'm here. He said things like, I am, I was recently in the place where I'm going to do it in our building. And I was checking it out to make sure that the way I do it will work. Now, they did not bring that knowledge forward. They did encourage him to get help. They certainly did that. But they did not tell anybody themselves. They did not go to their supervisor. They did not go to human resources. They did not go to the health and wellness contacts at the, at the location. And the reasons that they gave for not doing that were that they were not at all certain that the right things would happen. They weren't sure that he wouldn't be treated in a way that perhaps was punitive. They were afraid that maybe this would make it impossible for him to have a promotion or to be given key assignments. I wanna look at this very, very clearly because what these people who knew, again, their language, knew that he was going to kill himself, what they did was they were more disturbed at the prospect of him being stigmatized by letting this knowledge be open to other people than they were by the prospect of his death. That's how powerful stigma can be. That's how stigma can help people die. Now, let me tell you another story. And this is a far better story. And that is that there was a similar. Now, this uh, suicidal thinking is not terribly uncommon. Suicidal behavior is is far less common than suicidal thinking. Here's another story. So there was a man who came to his workplace and he told two of his coworkers, or I should say he asked two of his coworkers, he said, will you please come home with me after work today and take away my guns? And he proceeded to tell them 
that the night before, and it had been a weekend, so this was a Monday, the night before, he had been sitting down, he had his pistol to his head, he was ready to end his life, and his mother called. And his mother called, and she broke him out of what is sometimes called the trance of despair. And he then did, thankfully, very thankfully, he did not want to go back and put that pistol to his head. So he came to work, and that's what he told his coworkers. Now, they did not keep this secret. They said they would absolutely go with him, but they also went to their supervisor, who went to their human resources professional, who eventually came to me. And the reason they came to me is that my responsibility at Prudential was to coordinate what was called the Safe and Respectful Incident Oversight Team. And that team included, in addition to behavioral health, the leader from corporate human resources, employee relations, and the leader from global security. And we would pull together immediately when there was any concern about disruptive, potentially violent behavior, any kind of indication that there could be be, uh, an incident that would be on the continuum of disruption or up to and including workplace violence. And so this was brought to our attention. I was able to get in touch with the individual himself. He was in therapy, get him to his therapist so that he would be able to have an immediate heightened degree of support. Now, in order for that kind of openness to happen, there has to be a culture in which it's communicated that we can be ourselves at work. We can, even in casual conversation, we can mention things about our lives. We can mention the struggles we have. Now, we're, we will talk at length about what leaders do, what exceptional leaders do to foster that kind of culture. And I will say this, that if you supervise, if you supervise a team, you are that team's culture. You are the role model who sets the tone, who everybody's watching every day and paying attention to. And they are modeling themselves after you. And so the ways that you interact with others the ways that you are either respectful or disrespectful, the ways that you pay attention to civility, the ways that you allow people to talk about their lives, all of these things that you do day in and day out are creating your team's culture. And you have to be aware of that. This is one point of similarity between parents and work supervisors. Now I say that with great caution because there are many, many, many differences between the role of parent and the role of work supervisor. But when you are the leader, the formal leader for a group, everybody in your group is paying attention to you as a role model. And you wanna keep that in mind always. I had the opportunity to speak at a conference Just a couple weeks back, the conference was sponsored by the U.S. government's Department of Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Veterans Administration. I can't believe I actually got that title correct. They have these outrageously long titles. And the conference was about suicide and depression. And I had the privilege of opening, giving the opening talk and talking about the importance of culture and the importance of an open culture. But a little bit later on in the conference, I asked the group this question, and there were about 190 people there or so. I said, look, we're all here and we're trying to, we're trying to create supportive 
interventions and supportive environments for people who may be at this extreme point in their lives. And, and, I, and I told them, and I told them, I think earlier on in the conference, I said, look, I live with migraines and I live with back problems and I take the best care of myself that I can. I work out to get my back, to keep my back as strong and all of my, all of my, all of my self physically as strong as I can. But I also live with cyclothymia. Cyclothymia is a low grade of bipolar affective disorder. And what it means for me is that I have a huge amount of energy most of the time, like I'm just going and going and going. And also a certain amount of irritability is often connected to that. And it's not been a bad thing for the most part. I have worked very hard. I've made many different accomplishments. So if you want to learn more about this, there's a book called The Hypomanic Edge. That kind of heightened energy is called hypomania. But there's a downside and that downside can be dangerous. And so I've been in that place where I've thought of self-destruction. And, and you know what? Many, many people have. And what I said to this group was, I said, look, how many of you have had even passing thoughts of suicide? And raise your hand if you have. So I raised my hand. About five people did. And, and what I said was, if you didn't raise your hand, but you have had those thoughts, think about this. Think about that being the stigma that held you back and how important it is for us to be honest and truthful if we expect others to be honest and truthful with us. The way I see it, there is no them. There is only us. And if we can see each other as fellow human beings, if we can see each other in that light, we are gonna be able to move through the silences. We are gonna be able to move through the topics that we're gonna talk about over the next several weeks in a way that's gonna be helpful and healthy for us. Mr. Rogers, how many of you remember Mr. Rogers said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. That's the theme of this show. If it's mentionable, it's manageable. I'm Ken Dolan Del Vecchio. You've been listening to Work Life Confidential. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Randall Libero, and our engineer, Josh Randell. And I thank you so much for being with me. I'm looking forward to our future conversations. Join me next week when we'll be talking with Dr. Park Dietz.